Hey everyone, welcome to 3D6 Down the Line. My name is John. I'm going solo tonight. We're doing a little bit something different than our normal actual plays. I thought this would be the perfect time to do a deep dive into the upcoming Dolmenwood tabletop role-playing game by Gavin Norman and Necrotic Gnome. It is currently on Kickstarter. It is fully funded. It is doing quite well, mowing through the stretch goals as we speak as of the taping of this video. And I'm sure that if you are Longtime fans of 3D6 Down the Line, you are probably already a fan of Dolman Woodhead, have already made your pledge on that Kickstarter. If you are brand new, or if this is your first visit to 3D6 Down the Line, probably due to Gavin's kind linking to our site on the Kickstarter page, then welcome. I am the referee for a group of close friends that upload our sessions that we play in the old school style. We currently have two campaigns available to watch. One is the Dolman Wood game and the other is the Halls of Ardenville Mega Dungeon. You can find us over on YouTube, of course, if you just go right over here to our site. And all the links for these will, of course, be down below. You can see here that we have our playlist for Dolmenwood, which is 22 episodes long, long enough to give you a very thorough tour of the setting and the game. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention my colleagues on YouTube's excellent quality actual plays in Dolmenwood as well. We have 20 sides to every story, who has a 18 session long uh, ongoing campaign, and of course, 11 foot pole, which also has an ongoing actual play at 21 episodes and running both excellent please go check them out and like and subscribe to their channels as well if you want more Dolmenwood information than what we are providing here on YouTube, there are plenty of places that you can find it. Of course, the number one place is to go straight to the Necrotic Gnome website where you can see here he has uh, a lot of material that you can check out. Press kits, a uh, quick description of what you can expect, and as well, a free preview PDF, which is 76 pages long of actual material from the unfinished work. So it is uh, worth your while to head over there and grab that PDF and take a look. As well, highly recommend going over to Reddit, where Gavin did an AMA and asked me anything on Reddit with the fans. He did this uh, a little while ago. Lots of good material here where you can see Gavin um, answer tons and tons of questions from the fans so please do go and check that out as well and of course if you want to get more 3d6 down the line content the best way of course is to like and subscribe um, you can also head right over to our brand new official website where we have all of our content available you can find both of our campaigns if you just scroll down you can see them both right here we have dolmenwood in the halls of our if you want to watch dolmenwood you can do it right on the site just by clicking right into dolmenwood clicking videos and then scrolling down and you can see that there they all are in all of their awesome glory. So plenty of ways to get your Dolman Wood fix until we wait for the physical books to show up on the shelves. So I thought that I could provide an interesting and unique perspective on the upcoming materials because I have run multiple campaigns in Dolman Wood using the unfinished material that was released to us by Necrotic Gnome for being Patreon members. So if you look at the PDFs that I actually display on the screen in my actual plays for Dolmenwood, those are early beta PDF versions of the work in progress as Gavin was releasing it to us as paying Patreon members. And what initially attracted me to Dolmenwood was the cachet that Necrotic Gnome actually brought to it. If it was something that Necrotic Gnome was making, I automatically stood up and paid attention because he is known across the industry for his mastery of layout and information design, the sheer useful value of the works in your hand as a referee while you are actually gaming at the table or online with your friends in the moment, not just as a reference work while you're preparing or just reading for pleasure, but actual useful value while you are reacting to your player's actions at the table itself. I cannot stress enough how much the the design and layout of old school essentials in the adventure modules which he has written for the for that system has changed the way that i referee games and he has amped that up by several degrees in the layout and information design of the Dolmenwood game and i cannot wait to get my hands on it and i can say from experience having run two Dolmenwood campaigns one online with my friends that you can freely see over at 3d6 down the line and one in person it was an open table game at my friendly local game store, which was mostly filled with players 
whose experience with role-playing games was most of the modern D20 games, and this was their first exposure to the old-school style. And I owe a lot of that success and the enjoyment that those players had due to how easy it was to actually referee that game using the materials provided. And all of you are about to see that value on the page. Before we dive in, I should make it clear that Necrotic Gnome has not sponsored this video. I am not being paid. And if you're looking for a hard critique of the Dolman Wood game, you're not going to find it here. I am admittedly extremely biased in favor of the game. And I just want to share my love of it with all of you and give you a taste of what you can expect after the Kickstarter campaign ends and what will be in your hands in hopefully a little bit more than a year. As well, you should also be aware that the material that you're about to see is an unfinished work. It is still in progress. Much of it is finished, but Gavit is still working on getting a lot of art inserted into the books. And of course, there are constant revisions going on all the time and uh, probably will until we actually see it in our hands. So just be aware that this is unfinished and is not the final version. All right. You ready to get into this? Let's go. Okay, first up we have the Player's Book, which is the first of the three core books, which include the Player's Book, the Monster Book, and the Campaign Book. The Player's Book has all of the core rules for the game, everything you need to play. You do not need to reference any of their work other than the Dolman Wood game. And it also includes all, of course, the player's options and a lot of uh, interesting, fun things and a good introduction to the setting as well. And as we go through it, I'm going to be speaking extemporaneously as we sort of walk through it. I'm sure I'm going to find some things that are new to me as well. So let's take a look, shall we? So we have the table of contents here, and as you can see, it is all thoroughly hyperlinked. So if I click on Rank 1 Arcane Spells, it goes right to that chapter, which is just fantastic. I can't speak highly enough of Gavin's mastery, once again, of layout and information design. It really shines when it comes to actually navigating the PDF on the fly. Um, I use this extensively extensively in my game on 3d6 down the line and i also used it on my little laptop that i was using in my in-person game as well i just find it extremely easy to navigate and i'm going to highlight the ways uh, in which that is the case as we move through these books it really really comes to to play in the campaign book wait till you see that one so first of all you can see the table of contents we have the introduction starting play um which is building a character the different kindreds, uh, the different classes, magic, equipment, services, and animals, adventuring, and the appendices, which is a lot of real interesting, fun stuff in the end. So you can see it is a complete game here in the player's book. All the rules you need to play. One of the first things you're going to notice immediately upon opening the book is the wondrous artwork that is throughout. There are a number of well-known artists that Gavin has commissioned to do the artwork. Um, in my mind, my favorite is this person here. She does all of the chapter headings. Um, I'm going to screw up the pronunciation of her name. She is Finnish, and I'm so sorry for butchering the name. I believe her name is Paulina Hanuniemi. Um, please correct me if anyone knows the correct pronunciation. Her work on Dolman Wood is what drew me to the work in the first place. I find her work perfectly evokes the setting. I don't have the terminology to describe it, but I just know I love it when I see it. So um, you can look forward to a lot of her work uh, in the books themselves. So right away, if a player is opening up this book for the first time, he's saying, why are you picking up this game? What are you going to be doing when you play this game? And right away, he lays it all out. You're going to explore the wild places of the wood. You're going to unearth treasure hoards. You're going to confront fell beasts. You're going to journey along fairy roads. And I like here at the very end, and he says, you're going to return to the homely hearth, which I love, to share tales of peril with quaint locals over a mug of ale and a well-stoked pipe. And that's more than just words. He has rules for pipe smoking and full panoply of different kinds of ale and victuals that you could have at any number of unique and flavorful inns. It's absolutely wondrous. So you can have just as good a time hanging out in an inn as you can delving into the dark wilds of Dolmenwood. It's amazing. Um, we have a nice sidebar here of all the inspirational media. Definitely take a look at all of this. It gives you a really good picture of the vibe that he's going for, right? So this is a dark, 
haunted fairy tale force that is heavily inspired by British folklore. So it has a whimsy and a sort of tongue in cheek humor to it. But at the same time, it has that, that dark fairy tale aspect where things can get pretty nasty, especially around the edges and the dark places in the woods. He gives you an overview here of what you're going to be finding, the breakdown of the chapters, and what you might need to, in order to run the rest of the game. As you can see here, it's just the campaign in the monster book, and then if you'd like any of the future adventure scenarios that are going to be released, and a link to the website itself. The factions and powers in Dolmenwood are some of the most enjoyable aspects I found of the setting. They are extremely flavorful in pitting them against each other and seeing what machinations the player characters use in order to pull strings and leverage is really, really fun. It really gives the referee something to bounce off of whenever you sort of drop these hints about what is going on on the sidelines in the setting. And then the PCs are like, oh, that's interesting. And they go towards that and they tug this little string and that causes the domino effect across all the different factions. It can be really, really fun to watch that go down. And you can see here that there's a one page brief gazetteer, which outlines some of the more well-known geographical locations in the setting um, and this is all material that is uh, completely safe for players to see and then we go into part two starting play and it looks like here that gavin has a section that he's going to fill in here on role-playing games in general just defining what role-playing games are and we have terminology the classic glossary of terms which lays it all out for you here in a nice sidebar here on dice notation for anyone who's brand new to role-playing games i like that gavin is not assuming that you are a dyed-in-the-wool veteran gamer that this could quite possibly be someone's very first role-playing game i like that a lot then we have a description of the different character statistics anyone who's played any edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Most of these will be very familiar to you. We have saving throws and armor class and hit points, experience points, things of that nature. Um, they are mostly presented in an old school style, uh, just so you're aware. So if you're familiar with the older versions like the basic expert version from 1981, this should all be very familiar to you. And he makes a point here of pointing out that there are monster statistics that are in the monster book itself, but there are some monsters that are actually in this book. And so he gives you a brief overview of um, the stat blocks of those monsters. And then we go into creating a character. And he gives you a nice summary of the classes that are available and a step-by-step -step clearly laid out sequence for actually building a character. So the classes that we have here, there are four of the classics. We have the cleric, the fighter, the magician, otherwise known as the magic user, and the thief. In addition, we have Dolmenwood specific classes. We have the enchanter who uses glamours and runes instead of spells, the friar who is sort of a wandering religious mendicant, uh, the hunter who uh, sort of Gavin spin on the ranger archetype. Uh, I think it's much cooler than the ranger actually. The knight that is sworn to one of the noble houses in Dolmenwood and the minstrel, which is very much like a pied piper sort of archetype. It's uh, really, really fun to play. This is a good time to point out how quick character creation can go because you are not spending your time by the rules as written, buying equipment, which can often be the, the slowest part of building a character in the old school style. Instead, the default is actually rolling for equipment and you roll on these charts and you just do it all randomly. There is the optional rule for buying equipment if you'd like to piecemeal it, but you can whip up a character in probably five minutes. I've definitely done that, especially at my open table in person where people are just kind of coming in and out of the game and they're coming in like five minutes before the game's supposed to start. I just throw them a character sheet and we just whip through this really fast and they've got a fully fleshed out character ready to go. And of course, I should mention that the way that you generate your ability scores, strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, and charisma, is you roll three to six down the line. And I really like this here. He has a two-page spread dedicated to an example of creating a character using the sequence from the page below, from the page before. And it looks like here that he's creating a Bregel friar by the name of Kruin Wolder using all random generation, which is really, really cool. So you can kind of walk through it with him like that a lot and then we kind of dive down deep into the actual generation of ability scores what ability scores do and alignment it is the classic lawful neutral and chaotic because let's face it folks 
morality is a sliding scale and is very hard to pin down. So I am all for the three axis rather than the nine axis. I think it allows for much more freedom of play without kind of pinning you down. So yay to the three classics. Then we have a page for advancement. This is actually really good for referees to actually know as well, but it's good that he actually is making it transparent for players as well. So, and once again, the old school style, a lot of your XP is going to be coming from, is going to be coming from treasure gained, where one XP per one gold piece value of treasure recovered. That is classically old school. And you get a much smaller amount for foes defeated. Um, and then you're going to divide that amount amongst the party members who are there. And then, of course, retainers are a big part of old school play as well. And retainers also take a share of that XP. And then leveling up and then an optional rule for training. We have a two-page two page spread here for the languages of Dolmenwood. These are really, really fun. Common is actually known as Woldish. Um, and there's an older version of that. We have the Bregel tongues, both low and high of Caprice and Gaff. The language of the church, the Pluritine church, liturgic, and the secret tongues of the Droon, which is the secret cabal of arcane magic hoarders that are in the deepest, darkest parts of the forest. We have their tongues, um, uh, the Mossling tongue, which is a kindred race, which is a kindred, and the uh, immortal tongues of fairy, which there are multiple. So very, very fun languages that your player character can know. And... At this point, before we move on to the next section, you have probably noticed at this point how well laid out things are, right? Everything is on either a single or double page spread. This is a signature aspect of Necrotic Gnome's layout and design, and you should be able to see here on the screen before you how useful this is. You know that when you basically open up a page, that all the information regarding that topic will probably be laid out on either one or two pages. Everything you need to know about languages is on these two pages. Alignment is a single page spread. Advancement is a single page spread. Everything you need to know about either is all contained on that single page to reduce page flipping. And you can see here that the use of fonts and coloring with the laid out is uh, very easy on the eyes. You can parse information quickly and find what you need with a minimal amount of time. And that is a referee's most precious commodity, as we all know out there, is time and you need to be able to get the information quick and get it to your players quick and that is what gavin is a master of all right part three we go into the kindreds this is gavin's term for what we know in the older editions of dungeons and dragons as races there are quite a few interesting and fun ones they are divided between the mortals the fairies and the demi fae he gives a nice description here of what the difference is between those three types of kindreds Fairies here are the dangerous sort of King of Alfland's daughter, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell variety, where they are dangerous creatures that you would be, it would be folly to truck with, uh, more or less. Like there is always a consequence to dealing with fairy. So first up, we have the Bregel, which are the goat-headed folk, which are native to the High Wold, which is in the southwestern part of Dolmenwood. They are mortal beings as well, and they determine their social status by the length of their horns. The longer their horns are, usually the older they get and the more experienced they get, the higher in social rank they go, which is really cool. There are mechanical benefits to having uh, high, longer horn lengths, as you can see here on this chart. But what's really cool is that it gives you a, it places them in the world immediately imparts flavor that you can buy into as a player that immediately kind of fires your imagination. Okay, so I'm starting as a low status Bregel citizen of Dolmenwood, but I can achieve if I work hard and, and, and am successful in my adventuring, the high upper class nobility of a powerful Bregel lord if I can survive long enough, right? You can see here that he has a great um, random chart for every kindred four names that are... Um, uh, really, really fun and very, very flavorful. And then this, this, oh my gosh, this is the best. He has this for every single kindred. He has full random tables for generation of all aspects of their appearance, their desires, their beliefs, their possible backgrounds. And then where the real creativity comes into the fore are these D100 tables for trinkets. They're just so creative and random. And what he does, he just gives you just enough to fire your imagination and make you think, okay, this appears to be useless, fun, but 
it makes you think, what could I possibly use this for? It gets the players automatically thinking about what they're going to do with the things on their person before they've even stepped foot into adventure yet. I love that. So you have interesting things like they, a Bregle could randomly have the cured skin of an entire deer. What do you do with that? What kind of possible uses can you, can you find for the skin of a whole deer? Do you trade it in? Do you use it as a cloak? If it's, if you end up rolling randomly that the campaign is going to start in winter, which I did for both of my campaigns. Are you going to eat it, maybe? Who knows? A string from the bow of a legendary hunter. Wow. Are you going to try to actually pass off that story in town and try to get some money for it? Or are you going to actually string your own bow for it? Is it like a totemic thing for you? All sorts of things that just kind of will spur your imagination. You have all of your really cool appearance things, but then you also have these desires and beliefs, which automatically kind of places you within the world if you're willing to sort of roll with this. I highly recommend random generation at all times. Instead of having a concept in mind and trying to uh, formulate a character around that concept, just go with the dice rolls, man. Just let the dice kind of speak to you and roll randomly and see what kind of interesting character you're about to play. It's more fun, in my mind, to be surprised whenever you roll up a character, to be like, oh, I'm going to play this? Awesome. Roll on these random tables and find out that you thoroughly believe, your character believes that the Duke is in thrall to the Droon. What are you going to do with that information knowing that the Duke of Dolmenwood, the highest noble house, is actually just a patsy of the Droon, right? And your character believes this. It may or may not be true. How does that shape your interactions with noble houses, with the Duke himself, should you happen to meet him, right? All interesting things to fire the imagination once again. Elves, right? So these are not like your typical D&D elves. These are, these are creatures of fairy. They are very dangerous. They have just the best names. I highly suggest rolling on this table for names. I mean, just look at these names, how creative they are. They're just wondrous. Use them for your own inspiration as well. Their favorite class is Enchanter. Oh, we should go back to the Brego real quick. Uh, favorite class is the Knight. All right, so the Noble Knight for the Brego. Um, they are very into social status, as we talked about with the horns, and so a knight is a natural, natural favorite class for them. Um, elves is the enchanter because they use, they are creatures of fairy, so they use glamours and runes. Um, is sort of like their bailiwick, right? And we have more tables for them. So we're like a real quick, we have a couple of trinkets here. We roll a 30. We have a spider that slowly weaves webs in the shape of clothing. Fantastic. A trinket one of the trinkets you can get is a pleasant dream that is distilled into a liquor. I mean, come on now. It's fantastic. And maybe one of your desires is to uh, to grow old and die. That's one of your desires because you are an immortal being. Amazing. And look at some of these backgrounds here. You're a dream thief. You're a peacock trainer. You're a unicorn handler. That's your background, right? So in the typical old school style, your background can often be a great trigger for your referee um, whenever he's making calls about what you may or may not know or what you may or may not be able to do, right? If you are a unicorn handler and you actually come across a unicorn as a random encounter in the woods, you very well might ask your referee, you might say, listen, can I go up to the unicorn and actually touch it on the nose? And then your referee might look and see that you were a unicorn handler and he may not even have you roll. He would just be like, yes, absolutely. You can certainly do that where anyone else would probably have to make a roll or not be able to do that. That's what these backgrounds can sometimes speak to. And then we have the Grimalkin, which are the shape-shifting cat fairies, uh, fond of mischief and illusion. And they are really fun to play because they can shift in between three different forms, the estray, which is the humanoid cat form, which is sort of depicted here. And we have the Chester form, which is basically a normal cat. And then there is the wilder form, which is very much inspired, I think, by the Cheshire cat from Howl's in Wonderland. They are not e easily perceived in the mortal world, except for like a pair of gleaming eyes, which is really, really fun. They have an amazing ability, an actual mechanical ability to eat giant rodents. Um, and to gain, actually, they can actually heal after doing that. And when they shape shift and they go into wilder form, it's basically similar to how a barbarian going into a rage form where they, they don't, they can't quite distinguish between friend and foe as they just kind of go crazy. It's a, uh, it's really like basically like a cat on catnip. Uh, very, very fun. Oh, and their, their favorite class is thief, which makes sense. Let's see what some of the Grimalkin trinkets are. 
uh, a rat king in a sack. Each rat inside claims to be the king of all rats. It's fantastic. That's what your character could start with. Um, a handkerchief stained with the kiss of Queen Abyssinia. She's one of the uh, immortal rulers of a fairy land. Uh, a hairball coughed up by a famous Grimalkin. That's lovely. And you can be a thespian or a highway robber, a libertine. It's fantastic. You want, what's your desire? Uh, fame as a slayer of monsters. You want to found a catnip distillery. So here you can see like the whimsy sort of come through um, in Gavin's writing. I really like, I just love these tables. I could just spend all day reading these. They're fantastic. And then we have the human, the exotic folk of the day-to-day -day world. In my online game of Dolmenwood, I required that all the players actually start as human. They did not have the choice to be any other kindred because I felt that encountering those other folk of the wood would make them much more exotic and wondrous when they first encountered them. I think this is a common tact that a lot of referees will do with old school games is that they require you to start as human and then as you unlock or interact with other kindreds, that you can then, if your character dies, or if you want to create a second character, you can then make a character of that kindred. It's just you have to, you have to in world have interacted with them in some sort of significant um, way. In that way, it sort of preserves the um, exotic nature of these other kindreds as creatures of fantasy, which is really really fun. In my in person group the one that I played at my local game store, those folks were coming from, a lot of those folks were coming from a um, fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons mindset, which is sort of like that melting pot where you have like a, a party of just all sorts of interesting, uh, interesting kindreds. And so I felt I would probably have a rebellion on my hand if I laid down the law and said, like, you could be human only. So I did allow them to play anything that they wanted. And believe me, they jumped at the chance. We had, we had Grimalkin, we had Woodgru. We had, we had everything under the sun, plus a few humans. And you can see here that humans did not get the short shrift when it comes to the random generation tables. Theirs is just as creative and varied as any of the other more exotic kindreds. Um, you can see here that you could be a unicorn hunter or an outlaw. You could even roll for a trinket, a wanted poster for yourself. I mean, that's amazing. How much does that actually tell you about your character right off the bat? Are, does that make you an outlaw right off the bat? Or maybe you were framed? Who knows? You get to decide, right? What happens if you rolled for your background, for instance, that you're just a, an apothecary, yet you have a wanted poster for yourself? Are you then a, are you a poisoner, perhaps? Is that why you're wanted? Um, all sorts of interesting uh, possibilities here with these tables. Uh, then the Mosslings, these guys are fantastic. They're mortal creatures, but they're small and they have, um, they're sort of like an amalgamation, like a synergy between sentient folk and uh, the fungi and growths of, of the forest itself. So you can see here that they actually become wiser and more plant-like as they age, um, which is really, really fun. And their favorite class is Hunter. And their armor and weapons actually have to be tailored to their own small size. And they have, uh, they actually make their own special suits of armor, which are made out of um, bark sometimes and pine cones, which is really, really fun. And they have this really fun table here called the symbiotic flesh that you can roll on that um, is sort of a manifestation of the spores, which sort of germinate in their body. So they're really, some of them are gross, some of them are really funny. So a gross one, you actually have edible toe cheese. Mm. Um, and you have climbing vines wrapped around your limbs and torso. So you can see no two mosslings are ever going to be the same. They're going to be very varied in appearance, which is really, really fun. And uh, look at this guy. I mean, this is just one of my favorite paintings ever. Just, just the best. Like, I want to play this guy so bad. Um, and they have all sorts of crazy trinkets that you could get. A jar of blue cheese massage oil. Um, <laughs> uh, a water skin of yellow slime that drips upwards when unstoppered. Fantastic. And look at these backgrounds, man. Sausage maker, a squirrel trainer, a worm farmer, right? I mean, this stuff is, it's just so imaginative. Um, you you believe that you get visions from the moon. Um, humans are nothing more than naked monkeys. It's, <laughs> it's good stuff. Then we have the wood group. These are bat-faced demi-fey, and they are the party makers, man. These guys go to town. 
they are all about just finding like the next fix. They want that endorphin rush all the time. And they have this ability called Mad Revelry where they actually party so hard that they can actually have effects on uh, their targets. Here confide, the subject speak in a slurred voice, confessing some deeply hidden emotion or revealing an ally's secret. Uh, the strip is, the, is hilarious where subjects remove all their clothing and armor. Um, I had a friend in my in-person game who played a Woodgrew and played them to the hill, and he was so funny the way that he leaned into these abilities. Um, they're, they're troublemakers. If you don't have the right kind of player, this could be <laughs> they could become quickly annoying. But someone who understands what the spirit of this um, or what this kindred is, you, it'll be an asset to the party. It'll just it'll be nonstop comic relief. It's they're they're fantastic. What's their favorite class? Minstrel. That's, that make, definitely makes sense. So let's see what some of their trinkets could be. Let's pick two of them at random. Um, your uncle's famed recipe for moth cakes. Mm, a poster for your parents' last ill-fated circus performance. Oh, that's kind of sad, actually. And what's one of your desires? You want to be canonized, but as a joke. <laughs> Just to stick it to those uh, up, uppity church folk. All right, so those are the kindred that you can play. Next up, we have the classes. This is really interesting stuff. So you have your classic classes, one of which is the cleric, but it's presented in a much different manner, both mechanically and for flavor. Um, so let's take a look at the cleric. I'm not going to go through every single one of these classes in this amount of detail, but this is a good example of what you can kind of expect. So you have a prime ability right here. So if your wisdom is a certain level, you're going to get a bonus to XP if you're playing a cleric. You have your hit points per level, pretty standard stuff. Um, their combat ability is semi-martial. They can use any armor, including shields and any weapons. We all know this from if you have any experience with Dungeons & Dragons. This should all be familiar to you as when it comes to clerics. Now, right off the bat, Gavin distinguishes the clerics from clerics from other games. They're an order of holy warriors sworn to the service of the Pluritine Church. And when you create a cleric, you have to actually choose one of these three holy orders, which are the ones that are most likely to go out and adventure. They are um, the Crusaders of St. Sedge, the Witch Hunters Inquisitors of St. Faxis, and the Lich Words of St. Cygnus, who watch over the dead and hunt down the um, and hunt down the undead. So it gives them automatic in-world reasons for wanting to go out and adventure. I don't think it's been explicitly stated, but I also take the way that this is me mechanically sort of arranged and designed that this is a conflation of both like the classic cleric from D&D and the paladin as well, which does not actually exist in the Dolmenwood game. They also have a really cool ability here to detect holy magic items by touch, um, and doing it takes a turn. Once again, time being the ultimate resource in old school games, this is the mitigating factor. You might think, oh my gosh, that's so powerful. Well, one, you have to touch it. You don't just sense it in the air like a detect magic spell. And two, it takes one turn to actually detect these things, which means it's basically about 10 minutes of time in game. So it's not something that you can do like in the midst of combat, for instance. And you can see here too that the three orders also provide a bonus of some sorts in very specific circumstances. This is also a good point to show that saving throws do have the same mechanic as in classic versions of Dungeons and Dragons, where you're trying to roll a d20 and hit a target number or higher on that in order to succeed. But they have been renamed, although they are the equivalents of the classic um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, saving throw categories. So they've been renamed into Doom, Ray, Hold, Blast, and Spell. I love this change because it makes it very easy to determine for a referee under which category of saving throw a certain effect um, should be relegated. So that is the Cleric. The Enchanter is a unique class to Dolmenwood, has very unique mechanics. Um, there are restrictions to playing this. It's Now he's careful to say here that typically only fairies and demi fae thus elves, grimalkins, and woodgrews, who are the only kindreds that fall under that category, can become enchanters. But he does give the proviso that a mortal with a strong connection to fairy may also become one. So um, a person with mixed fairy ancestry or someone who was actually kidnapped by fairies in childhood, this would be your classic changeling scenario. Um, the referee could rule that those would, uh, that enchanter could be a viable option for a mortal being. But you have to ask your, you would have to ask your referee. I think that it's better to like lean into the flavor of Dolman Wood. So if you want to play an enchanter, I would, I would probably rule as a referee that you must play one of the fairies in Demi Fae. But I, I'm restrictive like that. What can I say? Oh, well. 
they can use two different kinds of magic, fairy runes and glamours. Glamours are sort of uh, similar to cantrips. They're sort of low level effects. And we'll check those out when we kind of get to that chapter. And uh, fairy runes as well have are like secret sigils and they have three different levels of power and they have restrictions about how often you can actually cast them. Um, and they are very cool and very flavorful, very unique. So something that you really haven't seen in um, probably the more, the more common versions of Dungeons and Dragons that you've played before. The fighter, of course, is differentiated from your classic Dungeons and Dragons fighter by the use of combat talents that you can choose. So it has a little bit more going for it than your typical BX fighter. And you can see here, this is the same with all the classes that they actually do have a starting equipment that you can generate randomly, which I highly suggest you do. Their number of combat and talents increase as they level, so it does scale. And the friar is the wandering, uh, the wandering mendicant, wandering ascetic. They are very, very fun to play because they lean into a lot of the fun subsystems that Gavin has inserted into the setting. So they have um, a much better chance to forge than the average person. And there's a whole forging subsystem. So they actually have a two and six chance uh, to forge, which means that if they roll a one or two on a D6, they succeed at doing that. They gain a little bonus to armor class, which scales with level right here. That kind of mitigates the fact that they can't use armor i believe that's the case yeah no armor um they can use culinary implements as weapons so they don't take a penalty for using weapons they're not proficient with they can actually use them with skill which is really really fun like a frying pan a cured sausage is just fantastic flavor right there it does a d4 so the, an interesting difference between the friar and the cleric i believe unless yep it's still true so in the true old school way clerics do not actually gain a spell at first level they have to wait till second level before they can actually class, cast spells. However, your friar gets to cast it right away. Um, I learned that by accident when my in-game, my uh, in-person uh, campaign actually created both a cleric and a friar, and we realized that one could cast spells and the other one couldn't. We are like, ah, that's a very significant bonus that's just sort of tucked away in a small corner of the class description, but is very significant as far as terms of uh, power at first level. The Hunter is very, very flavorful, very, very fun to play. I have a friend who loves playing Hunters, loves Hunters, and refuses to play anything else. After she discovered this class, she will not play anything else in any other game. <laughs> she loves the Hunter that much. The obvious analog is the Ranger from other role-playing games, but whereas the Ranger oftentimes either has the Dristuerden archetype or the Aragorn archetype attached to it, the Hunter is much more, at least in my mind, kind of gives you that impression from like the Hunter from like Snow White, right? Um, that's the kind of character we're talking about here. They have an animal companion um, that they can forge a bond with, and they have these really cool skills of stalking and tracking, which is uh, similar to a ranger but what's really fun here is they have these really cool things called trophies so if they hunt down and slay a creature they can actually take a piece of it right the antlers or a tooth or something like that and uh, carry it on their person and when they do so they actually get a bonus to attack rolls against other creatures of the same type um, and a bonus to saving throws against that creature's special attacks so that's really cool because it dangles a carrot in front of the player saying like you should hunt down as much things as you can in order to gain these trophies in order to gain these bonuses and it just kind of creates this really cool image in the players and the party's head of what this hunter probably looks like with draped with all of this kind of morbid um, pieces of animals and uh, and fell creatures that they have slain in their adventuring career. It's really, really fun. I can speak from experience. They are very, very fun to see in action. The Knight. This is a very, very fun class to play as well because it uh, ties directly into the flavor and cultures in Dolmenwood. So you, if you choose to be a knight, you actually have to choose one of the um, houses of Dolmenwood to serve. And so they outline them here. There are eight lower houses. It looks like you cannot actually, by the rules as written, actually dedicate yourself to the house Brackenwold, which is the Duke's house, the one that is the liege lord of all of these houses, which is interesting, actually. One of my players in my in-person game played a, uh, a knight that was one of the most fleshed out characters that I've had the pleasure to referee. He fleshed them out through emergent play. He found out who this person was through actual play, which is really, really key in the way that I like to play games. And uh, he was a knight of House Harrimore. Uh, Sir Wynne Elfwit was his name, um, and I have very fond memories of his exploits. You have all sorts of fun stuff here. You have a chivalric code that you have to follow. You're really good with horses. 
So knights of levels one to two actually start as squires, and by the time they reach level three, they are actually knighted as full-on knights that are loyal to their liege lord. Um, I do recommend as a referee to allow the emerging gameplay to sort of determine when knighthood actually occurs, right? Like, so if the knight actually performs a great service for their lord, perhaps that knighting actually occurs earlier than level three. I don't think that's going to be any harm to that. It's just more for flavor purposes. That is what occurred with... Um, my friend who played Sir Wynn Elfwood, they did a great service for the Lady Haramore. And so he actually achieved knighthood prior to actually re reaching level three. It didn't change anything in the game for the worse. Um, but this is just a good guideline to sort of know that around level one to two, you're not a full on knight. You're just a, you're a squire. You know, you're at that level. Then by level three, you're more recognized as a more powerful servant of your lord. Um, and they have really cool combat abilities against larger than human sized creatures. Really good on horses once again. Um, and they are uh, resistance against fairy magic, which is really cool. Uh, the Magician is uh, the name in the Dolmenwood game for what we commonly know as a wizard or a magic user. Um, intelligence is obviously their prime ability. And they have the typical restrictions that we associate with your typical Vancean uh, spellcasters. Really fun and unique, though, about the Dolmenwood game itself is that you have these starting spell books that are just dripping with flavor. So Gavin gives you here a couple of possible reasons why you would have these particular books. Um, you inherit it from a mysterious ancestor, stolen from a cruel master, things of that nature. Um, and look at these names. We have the Charms of the Fae Court, Hogbrand's Incandescence, Smythe's Illuminations, right? And each of these has unique spells that are actually in here. So instead of rolling randomly for your starting spells or determining them for yourself, you can roll randomly on this chart, a D6, or choose one of these um, flavored spell books and have this sort of bes bespoke selection of starting spells, which have like a, a flavor to them. So it kind of determines the kind of magician that you're going to start out as. And there's nothing holding you to that. This is just sort of your initial selection of spells. I love this. I think every game that has fancy and spell casting should have something like this. It just, once again, fires the imagination. I know I've said it a thousand times, but every page of this is just dripping with it. They have the ability to actually detect magic. This is a common house rule in old school uh, Dungeons and Dragons. I love it. Um, it allows something that the magician can do when they run out of spells, right? They can always check uh, to see if they can, um, if they detect magic in the area. It takes a turn. So it is a time eater. Once again, the great, the great equalizer in old school games. And um, you can see here, I should have pointed this out with the cleric as well, that spells are actually known as um, uh, no longer spell levels, but spell ranks, just to differentiate between your character's level and the rank at which um, they can cast spells. The Minstrel. So this is the Dolmenwood version of the Bard, I suppose, but it is actually very, very unique, very um, different than a Bard's flavor. They are not jacks of all trade. I never liked that about Bards. That's why I, I never liked uh, playing them in all the editions of Dungeons and Dragons. But this has a very distinct flavor. I am pretty positive that Gavin's inspiration for this is the Pied Piper of Hamlin. If you just look at the way that his enchantment ability works, it's very tied to that that old tale. Um, where you can fascinate subjects and then get them to follow you, right? Which is just really, really cool. It's sort of dark, right? It's it's a little bit almost edgy and controversial, right? Like, like you're com compelling people. You're sort of dominating them through your your music or your singing. Um, and you're getting them to do what you want. Um, and they can counter charms as well. Um, and they're really good at lore and uh, sleight of hand, things like that. Um, and so they're very, their their skill set is very, very narrow and siloed, which I really, really like. I think that's really, really fun. So there's no doubt you're playing a minstrel. You're not just a jack of all trades. You're you're a very specific thing. And lastly, we have the thief. Who doesn't love the thief? So we have here the classic expression of these skills where you have a certain chance to succeed at these skills based upon your level. That chance gets higher as you level up. Um, in the classic expression of the Dungeons and Dragons, it was a percentile based. Um, here he has changed it to a certain number in six chance of succeeding. So you would roll a d6 for climb walls. And if you roll one, two, or three on the d6, you would succeed at climbing walls. Where in previous editions of d d it would be something like a 50% chance. And so you have to roll percentile dice and rolling under 50 would also succeed. What he has here, though, is this interesting sidebar which if you are fans of 3d6 DTL, you have seen this in action both in Dolmenwood and Ardenvul because I love it. Customizing 
thief's skills. So um, I highly recommend instituting this because your players will be happy. It gives them a little bit of customization and allows not every thief to basically be the same thief locked into this same progression no matter what. All your skills begin at one in six. So every single one of these is a one in six chance, but then you actually have exper expertise points to spend in those skills. And then as you gain levels, you get another two additional experience, expertise points to put wherever you like. And then this caps out at five and six. You can never ever have a six and six ability where you don't need to roll like 100% chance to succeed. There's always a chance to fail. So everything basically caps out at around, I believe that's about an 83% chance of success, which is good. There's always gotta be a chance of failure, right? I highly recommend using the customizing skills optional rule. Very, very fun. Your players will love you for it. Okay, moving into magic. So we have your arcane magic and what he calls holy magic. So um, once again, they are divided into ranks. If you're familiar with past editions of, of Dungeons and Dragons, even modern editions of Dungeons and Dragons, this is all going to be very, very familiar. It's fancy and you have to memorize the moment that you cast it, it is forgotten. Then you have to t spend some time to actually memorize your spells again. I feel that a big part of old school style games of which the Dolmenwood game um, definitely has that flavor. They forget that a big part of a magician's power is their ability to research new spells. It engages the player's creativity if you as a referee encourage them to spend time actually researching their own spells. So many players think that they're limited to what is on the page in the rule books for what the selection of spells are when the possibilities are actually endless, limited only by time and money. So if your player comes to you with a unique idea for a spell that they want to inscribe into their own spell book that is uniquely theirs, then you should encourage that by working with them to determine what the mechanical effects of that spell would be, what rank that spell would be based upon the power level, and what it would take in terms of time and money and components in order to research it and then cast that spell. Immediately invests the player into the setting and makes them feel that they've accomplished something. This is a huge part of being a magician in old school games. And you should lean into it. He actually has the rules for it right here under researching a new spell, what that all costs. So we have here all the list of the spells. So these are really, really fun. Most of them have been, um, you'll recognize what this is alluding to from other editions of Dungeons and Dragons, but he's added his own flavor to them. And sometimes, even though the effect is the same as a spell you may recognize the way that it actually forms the way that it exhibits itself is um, completely unique let's see if we can find an example here uh, vapors of dream i remember this one so this is like your classic sleep spell but look at the way that it manifests a roiling violet vapor that drifts from a point within range flowing in the direction the caster is choosing once again you can see how good the layout is where it clearly use of bolding and colons gives you uh, all the information you need to know with no extra, right? You need to find out what the spell does. You can immediately parse it within seconds. So it's very, very easy to find. And I also like that this is done in the old school way of listing the spells by their rank slash level rather than just um, clumping them all together alphabetically. I, I know that, and I can understand the reasons for the proponents of people who like the more modern version of everything listed alphabetically, but I like to be able to sort of look at the basic power levels of these spells um, laid out, basically. So you can see that within rank one spells, it is alphabetical, and then you go to rank two. But here's the difference between this and other older editions of D&D. They're all on two page spreads. Look at this, all your rank one spells, all right here on page 80 and 81. Rank two, three, four, five, and six. Super fun, super flavorful, and it's just so easy to find what you need. There's so minimal flipping, right? That's what it's all about. Fairy magic, right? So here are the glamours in the runes. So you can see here that glamours are not spells. You can actually activate them by thought alone. Extrapolate that out in play, the fact that you can activate them by thought alone without need for gesture or incantation. That means that silent spells don't work against you. The restraints don't inhibit your ability to cast glamours, right? It's very, very devious. It's a perfect sort of fairy flavor to the, to the glamours themselves. And then we move on to the runes, and these are limited with frequency. In fact, it's the opposite of glamours. They are, you can only use them very, very infrequently. So 
there are three different types of runes and then depending upon your level determines how often you can actually cast these runes the most powerful which are the mighty runes you can see here that all the way up until ninth level so at the rate at the brink of high level play you can only cast a mighty rune once ever once in your lifetime can you cast that rune when you finally achieve 10th level and higher then you can cast the mighty runes that you know once per year so that should give you an indication of how much access you're going to actually have for these mighty runes but they are so powerful that they could be the centerpiece of a quest or a major storyline um, in your campaign is just to get one of these mighty runes are you going to are you going to try to deceive a mighty elf lord in his own realm in order to trick him out of the rune that he contains so that you may cast it one time ever and i know that ben milton from questing beast also did a run through of dolmenwood as well and focused on some of the mighty runes because they're so flavorful but i want to show maybe a couple of the lesser runes to show how flavorful they can actually be as well because these are the ones that you're going to have access to right away if you choose to be an enchanter. So let's look at the first one here, Deathly Blossom, right? So an exquisite white rose is conjured in the caster's hand. If you are able to proffer the rose, if you're able to give it to someone who takes it willingly and smells of it, they have to take a saving throw. They have to make a saving throw, succeed at it, or fall into a deep faint, appearing dead. This is a great fairy tale thing. It reminds me of Sleeping Beauty or Snow White or something like that. And uh, so the flavor is very, very strong here. And you can see that the way that it's written, it's obviously intended that it is not used in combat. Okay, let's take a look at some of the greater runes here. We Let's pick one over here, random. The Rune of Invisibility. Seems pretty self-explanatory. Lasts for one day. Wow, okay. Um, you're rendered invisible. Everything that you're wearing is invisible. If you put something down, that does become visible. Now, interesting here is when you attack, you become momentarily visible and opponents can attack you that same round or the following round with a minus two penalty but what it doesn't say here is that you lose your invisibility you become momentarily visible and then the invisibility shroud um, once again protects you afterwards so very very powerful um, very very nasty and then the mighty runes of course uh, ben milton went over their the summon the wild hunt i mean let's just look at this this is ridiculous the dream ship eternal slumber so this is a classic fairy tale one permanent duration permanent a mortal within range is placed into a state of stasis in eternal sleep subject may only be awoken by magic or by a condition set by the caster i mean i don't even think i need to explain anymore what the inspiration for eternal slumber comes from amazing stuff you can cast that once ever nasty nasty stuff all right holy magic so this is where your clerics and friars are getting their spells from the pluritine church is the dominant religion in dolmenwood it is a religion that has come from outside the realm and been imposed upon the wood and it is basically followed by most of the rank and file citizens at least the humans and mortals of dolmenwood centered in the great city of Castle Brackenwold, where I believe it is the Cathedral of St. Cygnus, if I'm not uh, incorrect, which is the centerpiece of the church in this realm, in the duchy itself. It has a very uh, Roman Catholic flavor to it, um, a, a monotheistic religion, a, an evangelistic religion. And I, I like that because everyone sort of knows the basic tenets and feel and flavor of the Roman Catholic Church. So it provides a very strong touchstone for player characters that choose to uh, be members of this church. You immediately kind of know how to play these characters, right? And what uh, the Roman Catholic flavor really kind of comes through in the fact that it's not so much God that is worshipped, but more the invocation of the saints, right? There are a hundred saints that are all listed in this book, and all of the saints are associated with specific spells, which gives each of these normally banal divine spells a lot of flavor because they're all associated with a specific saint of Dolmenwood and a miracle that that saint performed, which gives rise to the name of the spell itself, which is really, really fun. So here in the rank one, let's see, look at the rank ones here that you're going to have access to pretty immediately if you were a friar, not a cleric, you have to wait till level two a simple spell like light right everyone knows light but the prayer name what the people in Dolman would actually call it would be saint fogarty's benediction so he leans into the fact that what you're actually doing when you're casting a divine spell is you're praying 
That's what you're actually doing. It's very different than what a magician does, right? Which is invoking something from a spell book, an old tome. You're praying to your God um, or you're praying to St. Fogarty, right? right? And then each one of these spells has a nice little sidebar that describes the miracle that's associated with the saint. So here, the miracle of St. Fogarty he spent his dotage ministrating to an isolated community of peat cutters. And when a party of pilgrims lost their way in the peat bogs one night, Fogarty commanded the marsh lights to lead them to safety. So there's an example of the saint actually casting the spell and the miracle that's associated with it. That is just fantastic. I love it. It just uh, melds the spell with the setting itself. And it's just, it's wondrous. I just love it. I wish every game did this. <laughs> They also have the ability here to pray at shrines. This is really, really fun. I think my players in both of my campaigns really like this, is there, is that the church is in retreat in Dolmenrud, right? It, it used to have a much wider influence within the wood, but then the depredations of the Nag Lord in the north and the pushback by the secretive Droon in the west has caused the church to actually retreat back um, and southwards, basically. The lost shrines to the saints litter the map all over the place. And this is sort of like, I love this. It's almost like a video game aspect that I really, really like. I say that in a positive way. And if you find a shrine, it doesn't matter what level you are. You can pray at that shrine. And if you restore it, you will actually gain a certain specific spell associated with that saint and then can cast it that day. In addition to any other spell that you can normally cast, it's super, super fun and flavorful. Holy spells go up to rank five, um, culminating in, of course, raised dead, which is the mercy of Saint Cluid. Saint Cluid is the patron saint of Dolmenwood, um, I believe, although that may have changed that Saint Cluid is the only saint that was actually martyred with under the bowels of Dolmenwood itself. Mossling knacks. So Mosslings actually have the ability to they have their own native magic, which is really, really flavorful. You can roll for them randomly right here. There are six of them, and they all have like super fun things to 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 play with wood kenning. I remember one of our players had this. Um, you're sensitized to the subtle vibrations of tree and wood. So you can spend a turn touching a wooden item or a trunk of a tree, and you can actually gain knowledge from the tree itself. So that's really, really fun. You can learn the name of a wooden item's creator or the name of the last person to touch the wood. So cool. I mean, it's gonna gonna keep the referee on their toes, but you know that's very very fun. Yeast master, so you can actually cause things to um, ferment, which is really really fun. A yeasty belch, right? A yeast feast. Um, friends with roots, you can actually summon a, a creature called a root thing to serve you. Uh, lock singer, where you can actually uh, sing into locks and, and charm them into opening. All right, moving into equipment services and animals. I love this painting. This is also by Paulina, who does all the chapter drawings. I can almost guarantee that this is the famous Jormy Wilpston Puddingfoot of Lankshorn, who is known for his uh, sword-making uh, abilities. One of the, the very well-known NPCs of Dolmenwood. Adventuring gear, you got your typical D&D style uh, gear here um, with prices and weights and all that kind of good stuff and full descriptions for what they do. Armor and weapons, you have your typical amounts here. We Damage is variable, so depending on what weapon you use, it does a certain amount of damage. This is common throughout almost all editions of Dungeons & Dragons, except the original, where you only rolled a d6. Um, if anyone is a fan of our series, you know that I use a house rule where your hit dice, uh, which is dependent upon class, actually determines how much damage you do, regardless of the weapon that, that you are using, which I find to be a very fun house rule. But um, no problem at all using variable weapon damage. Go to it. Lots of different qualities that um, each weapon has, so you can make a informed choice. And then weapons of special metals is really fun too. So you have your cold iron weapons. Cold iron, of course, has a special place in Dolmenwood because it is anathema to fairy. So it is very valuable to have. It both allows you to gain an advantage against fighting fairy, but it also targets you as an enemy of fairy kind. So it sort of has like a, um, a in-game reason to be wary of, the, of carrying it on you. He doesn't just have your typical war horse, riding horse, uh, draft horse breakdown. He actually has uh, Dolmenwood specific types of horses, breeds of horses, so a hog clopper, a dappled off, a pre warp prancer, a yellow flank, and they all have different abilities, right? Like different uh, proclivities. So you can actually make an informed choice about which kind of horse that you actually want, which is really, really fun. 
And we have hounds. Who doesn't love dogs? Everyone loves dogs. It's a litmus test, really. Um, the player of my hunter in my in-person game love these because they obviously good choices for animal companions, varying different stats and appearances. The lich hound, these are cool. They are bred by the church as companions for graveyard wardens and clerics of the Order of St. Cygnus. The Order of St. Cygnus is the lich wards, the undead hunters, right? This is one of the orders that you can choose when you create a cleric. Well, they tend to breed these lich hounds and bring them on their adventures with them. They do not fear undead. They do not need to check resolve whenever they are in combat with undead monsters, right? Which is basically like morale. Um, and they have a turning bark. Get this, once a day they can emit a bang that is terrifying to undead. And if they roll high enough, they can actually turn undead like a cleric or friar. How cool is that? Like, how much do you want one of those dogs to be with you? Just fantastic. This is um, a good example of the kind of which you would almost consider throwaway flavor, right? It's, but there's so much detail given to it. Like there's so much attention paid to it, a full two-page spread on just dogs. And it makes you immediately invest into it. It makes you want this, right? You want this in your game. Why would you not want to introduce these into your game? Lodgings and food. So you would think that this chapter, Equipment, Services, and Animals, would be the most boring chapter in the book. I know in most RPGs that this is the most boring chapter. This is the chapter that you skip over whenever you buy the book, right? But here, you can actually probably tell from the tenor of my voice how excited I've gotten just from opening up the Logic and Food chapter. This is where the gold of this setting really comes in. The otherwise mundane aspects of life are brought to the fore here in very creative and fun ways that make you instantly want to introduce it into your game. So look at here, you have poor, common, and fancy lodgings. When you open up the campaign book and you're referencing one of the many, many inns that are all unique in the campaign book, and it tells you that they provide poor food or fancy food or common food, you can come to this page, quickly roll up and find out what they are actually offering on any given night. And there is a full panoply of variety here. So if you're going to a rundown tavern in the seedy side of town, you can immediately just roll a D8 and you can come up with battered pizzles, what they're serving. The degenerative organs of a slaughtered bull, sliced up, battered, and fried, right? All the way up to fancy food, which is the only level of food service that actually provides desserts. But you can find blackbird pie, long mirror pike, maids of the lake, right? Unicorn rump, tender venison of the deer-like beasts known as false unicorns. The flesh of true unicorns may only be served at the duke's table, of course makes every visit to an inn a unique experience that your players will really enjoy. It doesn't have to be something that you just elide over. You can actually invest and have a good time. Every time that they walk into your average tavern or your average inn, you can provide this level of flavor just by rolling on random tables. It's fantastic. Same goes for beverages. Marrow height dark, a thick stout as black as midnight on a moonless night. So he gives you the look of it. It tastes of smoky bacon, and then it has an effect. It brings on a woozy empathy. And I love the fact that these effects don't have a, a mechanical aspect embedded in them. They just kind of tell you the sorts of drunkenness or the sorts of feeling you're going to have. And then it's up to the player whether or not they actually want to role play that out. Right? Very, very fun. Now, if you want to introduce some actual effects, we actually have a little subsystem here for inebriation, right? So it actually gives you a level that you can make constitution checks and depending on your level of failure, you can get wasted. And then Pipe Leaf, I promised this earlier on, there is a full page spread, a uh, full two page spread on Pipe Leaf itself. These give all sorts of different blends here. And then there is actually a rule for smoking. This is really, really fun. I wish we had used this more. None of my players have actually bit on the Pipe Leaf pipe leaf thing even though i dropped a few hints but no one actually kind of got into it i wish someone did so you can see here that he calls out that it's assumed that pipe leaf is there simply to add flavor but you can actually add a mechanical effect so quiet contemplation when you're vexed by a problem you can sit down get out your pipe and spend an hour quietly contemplating and debating with your companions then you're going to make an intelligence check and if several characters smoke and debate together the most intelligent character has to make the check with a bonus, depending on how many companions they're actually conversing with, which is really cool. And if you succeed, the referee gives the player a clue about the problem being contemplated. I just love that. It does put a lot of burden on the referee, a lot of referee fiat going on there, but I just love the fact that you can mechanically apply just quietly sitting and having a good smoke. It's great. Uh, common fungi and herbs. Once again, probably a chapter that you may have skipped over in another game. However, these actually have mechanical effects 
for each one of these uh, fungi and herbs. It tells you the availability that they are in many of the settlements in town, how much they cost, um, forging, what it takes to actually forge for these goods out in the wild, how much you can get for them when you bring them back to town. So there's a whole sort of mini game that you can do here where you're out there forging for specific um, fungi and herbs and bringing them back. You can either use them for your party for your beneficial effects or actually use them as uh, quest items, for instance, like you're like an apothecary needs before they can give you the secret to something that you need to go and find the, the moon haw berries out, out in the forest surrounding town, right? What we found when we were playing is that I believe it's good old spirit hame is great in a pinch when it comes to actually getting someone up after being downed in combat or in a bad way when you're in the midst of a dungeon and you don't have access to a cleric's healing or a friar's healing. Say you only have a cleric in the in the party in their first level. They cannot cast healing. So what do you do? Well, of course, before you went out, you bought a bunch of spirit hame, which is a delicate curled leaves of a rare moss. And when you crush them and apply them to a wound, it cures 1d2 hit points. Um, you can only benefit from one dose per day. That's a great mitigating factor. And it just gives you 1d2, but that's enough. That's enough to get you conscious, right? A whole spread on specialist servers. So how much they cost, where they can be found, what they can do for you. That's a very classically old school retainers. A whole system here for determining whether or not there are retainers in a given establishment or town, what kind of applicants they're going to be. You get all random tables here, um, all in uh, Dolmenwood specific, where the kindreds and what classes they might be, how much you should probably offer them in wages, determining what the reaction will be to your offer, depending on um, how generous you are, and then full rules for how about maintaining loyalty, sharing the treasure, sharing XP, um, what's the difference between townsfolk retainers who are just there to carry torches and then actually adventuring retainers as well. All right, moving into adventuring. This is the heart of the core rules of the game, how to play the game. And so Gavin starts here by laying out the basic game procedure. This is the gameplay loop, basically. The referee describes the situation using the character's five senses, basically. The characters then ask a question for clarification. The, D the referee will then come back and depending on their ability to know the answers to these questions that will provide more information. And then the characters determine what their actions are going to be. The referee judges and reacts to those actions. And then we resolve those actions and then it continues. This is classic old school style play. It's been applied a billion times in a billion different RPGs. I love this style of play. You can see it in action if you watch our videos over on 3D6 Down the Line, both in Dolmenwood and in the halls of Ardenbool. It's all about role playing, in my mind, is actually a conversation between the referee and the players and the players with each other. It is not play acting, right? It is not inhabiting a character. In my mind, this is all of my opinion, that is a fun and worthwhile endeavor while playing a role-playing game, but I don't consider that to be role-playing. I consider the heart of a role-playing game to be the conversation that is between the referee and the players. This is the kind of advice that you wish every RPG game had in its dungeon master guide, right? Or its, or its referee section, but often does not, right? This is very clearly laid out with specific advice. Another author that does this very, very well if any of you are fans of Dolman Wood or Necrotic Gnome, you're probably also aware of the author and designer Chris McDowell, who has created Into the Odd Electric Bastion Land and is currently working on Mythic Bastion Land. Some of the um, the referee advice in Electric Bastion Land specifically is considered to be the best GM advice ever written, and I put this on par with that as well. We have here an example of play that has yet to be written. I, for one, cannot wait for this to be inserted into the book because it's going to be such a callback to the editions that I grew up with um, playing Dungeons & Dragons, which always had a really fun page of, of a mock D&D group actually running through a, a short little scenario. And it just showed the interplay of um, what a typical conversation in this game would actually be like. And I think it really, really helps to illuminate what the expected gameplay style is. So I can't wait for this to be written. I'm sure Gavin's going to do a great job on it. How to prepare for an adventure, right? The adventuring party, the, the player roles. This is a great, great little section here. I love the fact that he inserted this. Um, these are classic old school uh, roles. The caller, the chronicler, the mapper, the quartermaster. Any of you who have watched my Arden Vool game know that Ted is our mapper. 
uh, players mapping their own maps is highly encouraged by yours truly. I think it adds a whole level of investment and immersion into the game, into the game world, instead of just having like something displayed for them or a fog of war slowly being revealed. Make them actually make the dungeon the map for themselves so they can actually uh, determine where there might be possibly be a secret room or determine escape routes and things like that. And they're going to get such a sense of value and worth by doing it themselves and having an actual piece of art as crude as it may be to actually show that they were paying attention, they're going to be that much more invested in your, um, in your world. Callers is always great, especially when you have a large group to have someone who is not necessarily the party leader, but the person that actually gets all of the players opinions together and then presents them to the game master. So the game master doesn't have to parse like eight different people's opinions. They can actually just say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And the caller can say, all right, referee, here's what we're, Here's what the party had decided to do. A chronicler is someone who um, constantly takes notes. We had um, a great player, the player of Sir Wynne Elfwit, who was the uh, pinnacle of the chronicler role and was very diligent in um, scribbling down notes and then presenting them to us on our Discord. And the quartermaster, this was our hunter player who was um, who continues to be actually a... Uh, a very valued member of the team because they love the bookkeeping aspect. This is also Ted in um, in our Arden Vool campaign as well. Preparation, marching order, dividing treasure. Okay, um, advice. This is great. Work as a team. Think outside the box. Use time wisely. Avoid unnecessary combat. No one to back out. These are classic old school tenets. It's so important that he outlines these because this establishes the expectation of the playstyle within Dolmenwood. I love this. Um, I think more games should have this. Most of your higher end, um, more well regarded OSR works do have something like this. But these are the, these are the classic tenets of the old school, right? Thinking outside the box, basically thinking laterally. Um, time as a resource. Uh, combat as war rather than sport. So um, the fact that combat that combat is basically like a losing situation. If you if you have to roll initiative, you've lost before you've even begun, really. Um, and knowing when to retreat. In the core rules, skill checks are basically, I believe, a D6 system. So yes, yeah, so a roll natural one is always a fail, and a six is always a success. So this is where you have your uh, your chance in six success. So you have a two and six chance, which means you have to roll a one or a two on a D6 to succeed. Um, this is very common in old school games. Um, ability checks, I believe, are different than what we've seen in other games. You're trying to roll a D20 and hit your ability score or under to succeed. In this game, I believe you have a base three and six chance. Yes, that is correct. So you have a base three and six chance, and then your modifier on your ability score modifies that. Um, and if the result is four or greater, the check succeeds interesting it's cool so it, it, it aligns it with the skill check system so it's all sort of of a piece so it's all d6 based which is really cool saving throws we went over that those have changed you're just rolling a d20 trying to hit the number or higher to succeed that's classic stuff attack rolls are rolling a d20 and attempting to beat uh, the opponent's ac we all know and love that time and movement this is really really important in old school play tracking time uh, resources with light how fast you move, um, keeping track of your encumbrance because it will reduce your movement rate depending on how much loot and equipment you have on you. Um, and he clearly outlines what all of these terms mean. Encumbrance here, we have uh, the classic, this is the classic old school carrying capacity, which is based upon coin weight since coins will be uh, is often what you're gonna be carrying out of dungeons um, and adventures. And then we have what I prefer, which is slot-based encumbrance. This is a system that is used quite frequently in a lot of the uh, new SR games, the new school revolution games like uh, Knave and Cairn. Um, I believe Mouse Ritter has a version of this as well. And I just find it a lot less tedious than the carry, the old carrying capacity rules. So basically you have a number of slots that you can carry and each item basically takes up a slot depending upon its uh, bulkiness. Some items are um, a little bit more. A bulky item takes up two, as you can see right here. And um, as you fill up your slots, your speed goes down and you have, let's see, eight slots in a sack or a backpack and you can carry nine equipped items. So these are the items that you can access quickly. And these are the items that are in your packs and sacks, which you then have to take, I believe, a round to, yes, you have to take a round to retrieve them. We use a version of this system in Ardenvul. 
And I believe we use it in the Dolman Wood as well. Maybe not. I can't actually remember. Rare Encumbrance is usually something that's forgotten in modern D20 fantasy-based role-playing games. It is very, very important in old-school games. And you'll actually derive a lot of enjoyment from the resource management of these games. And I highly suggest that you lean into it and go with it. Hazards and Challenges. An important call out here that he makes is the narrative interaction aspect of these things. The fundamental means of interacting with hazards and challenges is via the basic game procedure. You describe, the players describe their character's action and the referee judges what happens based upon the workings of the environmental feature being interacted with. So sometimes a die recoil is required, but often it isn't. If you have watched our videos on 3D6 DTL, you have seen me do this constantly where, where they are presented with an obstacle or a hazard like a trap or something like that. And I ask them how they plan to surmount the obstacle. And we it, all it is is a conversation. We role play it out. And if their, if their means by which they're going to surmount the obstacle seem reasonable to me and seems within their bailiwick and, and within their capabilities, I don't have them roll. They've described how they surmount it and I allow them to do that. Um, now, this all depends, of course, upon the danger and the nature of the obstacle, and if there's any sort of random factors. And if there is, I'll just let the dice decide. But always try to remember that a lot of times, a lot of these resolutions to obstacles and problems within the game can just be talked out. It is, once again, the conversation that is the most important aspect of play. That said, we have a whole bunch of interesting little subsystems here for typical hazards and challenges. So climbing... Um, making a dex check, right? Uh, darkness and blindness, uh, doors. So finding secret doors, locked doors, stuck doors, listening at doors. Now, what I really like that kind of ties into what I just discussed here is this sidebar here on adventure competency. So this is sort of saying that depending on what your lifestyle is, what your background is, what your class is, you can be assumed to be perfectly capable of being successful at some certain tasks, right? So you don't need to have like a riding skill in order to be good at riding, in order to ride a horse, right? You don't need to have a specialty skill in mapping in order to actually create a map, right? A lot of this is just assumed, but I like the fact that he calls it out and actually says, like, this is okay. It's allowed to make these judgments in the player's care in the player's favor. We have rules here for finding food in the wild finding hidden features in the dungeon, effects of hunger and thirst, jumping, of course, losing direction. Losing direction is very, very fun in Dolmenwood. There are charts in the campaign book, I believe. If you do get lost outdoors, you actually have to roll on a very flavorful chart where you could actually get lost um, in ferry, which is pretty fun. You actually get transported to ferry and you have to find your way out. Stealth, everyone needs to know what the specific rules are for stealth because they can get so complicated sometimes. Let's see what we have here. So it's assumed, this is old school, that your your exploration movement, which is your base movement rate, is you being stealthy. It's always assumed that the party is always trying to be stealthy. That's why we roll for surprise in the first place. When you're attempting to sneak up on someone, we have to assume, let's see here. Uh, yes, that if the, if the target is being vigilant, that uh, I may just, the referee may rule that this thing is just impossible, that it just won't work. Um, and then you make an, the referee can also rule that if you provide a distraction or if the target is naturally distracted, that I could just rule that your chance of it being uh, that the chance of them being surprised is increased, or I could just say that you naturally surprise them just based upon the environment. So Dolmenwood at his heart is a hex crawl, which means that you are, which means that travel is a big part of the game. It's all about traveling from hex to hex and exploring what each hex has to offer and what sites that you can explore. Um, within each hex. So we have to have detailed travel rules. This is all based upon the party's speed. You get a certain number of travel points per day, and that allows you to travel a certain distance. It's all modified by the type of hex that you are in. If you provide the player's map for your players, they can plan out their route based upon what these, what the terrain offers. So let's go back to the map here real quick and zoom in here. So assuming the players have access to the map, if they're setting out from Prigwart, it's likely that they will try to stick to the roads. The roads are less dangerous. You can travel faster. They are not inhibited by the terrain type, right? So it's usually the safest route. But if you're looking to explore, if you're looking to get into some danger, you might go off-road and go directly into 1107, right? 1107 appears to be Tangled Forest, right? So... Um, if they if they need to get to Fog Lake, there is no direct 
road path to Fog Lake from Prigwort. So they would probably most likely go as the crow flies into 1107 and into 1207, both of those being uh, hexes of, of um, Tangled Forest. So we'll go back into the player's book here and we'll see that Tangled Forest costs three points to move in. You can lead a mount into there. You can't ride them. You can't take any vehicles. And there's a two and six chance of a random encounter or getting lost. So that allows that decision-making point for the players. Are they willing to take that risk, right, of going off-road to get in order to get to Fog Lake? And they can plan their route ahead of time by determining how many travel points they have based upon their speed and how long it will probably take them to get there. And they also have to decide whether or not when they're moving through these hexes to Fog Lake, are they going to stop, perhaps forage, or hunt, or look for a lost shrine, or search for any other hidden mysteries within that hex, they're not going to know what's there. Do they want to spend the time? So you can see here that if they want to actually stop in 1107 and, and search out what might be hidden here, a full search actually takes the same amount of travel points that it took to actually enter into the hex. So traveling into the ta into the Tangled Forest Hex of 1107 costs them three points. And then if they want to spend time here and uncover all the mysteries that the Hex has to offer, it would cost them another three points. So they have to have at least a 30 speed in order to have that number of points, the six required in order to get that goal accomplished. So that's basically how it works. Um, very simple, um, but very detailed, which I like. Camping. We had a great time with camping. At least I had a great time. I know a lot of the players suffered for it, both of my campaigns. Yes, I'm looking at you, Argus, with uh, you're attempting to, con to camp with a constitution of five in the middle of winter without a bedroll. Good times. We have uh, a full-on camping procedure. You can see this in action in the video as I follow these rules, and they're a lot of fun. So the, the, you preparing the campsite, you're rolling to see how much firewood you can actually get. Um, Water is always assumed to be available because you're in a wood. Uh, building the fire, um, cooking will actually gain a bonus to the check that you're going to make to see how well you sleep because if you're on a full belly, you're going to feel a lot better. And then camaraderie, which is really, really fun. Uh, we had it where basically you didn't have to actually role play out an entire story or anything like that, but just kind of give a vague idea of what you do to entertain your fellow your fellow players and characters, um, and then you actually get a bonus to your role as well. And then depending on the circumstances of what uh, season you are in and how much protection and anyway, whether or not you have fire determines the difficulty and ease it uh, upon getting a good night's sleep, which is really, really fun. We saw this in action in both of my campaigns. You can see that on the videos that we started in winter. We rolled winter as the starting season randomly, and that makes everything much, much more difficult. They really had to think twice about whether or not they wanted to sleep out in the wild because it could be very, very painful consequences. And it was always about getting back to the homely hearth in one of the settlements so that they could sleep well. Speaking of settlements, it's like I knew what was coming. There is a whole chapter on what you can do in a town. I love this. There's a whole procedure for it, so you can determine what the weather is in there. Um, it's very similar to the adventuring procedure itself, actually. But the actions, unlike adventuring, where you're saying, like, I'm moving forward, or I'm searching for secret doors, I'm listening, I'm listening at doors, or I'm uh, casting my light forward. Here, it's determining what you're doing in town. Are you studying um, arcane lore? Are you trying to earn some money? Are you gossiping? talking to specialists or retainers or hiring uh, retainers, shopping, visiting NPCs, all the, these are all called out as specific activities that you can do. And then you're going to love this when we actually go to our deep dive in the campaign book, but there are full random encounter charts for both day and nighttime at each one of the 16 settlements that is detailed in the Dolman Wood setting. Um, and the referee should roll for those because they are always super enjoyable and interesting, flavorful encounters that you, uh, that you can experience when you're in town. And then this is the list of the services that can usually are usually available in some of these settlements and gives you the rules for those. Dungeons. This is fantastic. This is just good advice in general. I like the fact that it's actually been inserted into the game as whole. Once again, you only need this game. You only need these three books in order to play the entire game. So he's going to have advice here about how to actually run dungeon procedures. This is classic old school stuff. Yeah, establishing safe points, moving, time being as something that you must track. Resting is required, food, wandering monsters. This is a common house rule that you'll find on a lot of old school blogs about uh, making a random roll to determine whether you safely are able to escape a dungeon, which is which is really, really fun. Um, very, very fun for the referee, probably not so much fun for their players. Um, and encounters. 
I think this is just the player facing aspect of it. Yeah, this goes into more detail in the campaign book, of course, but this sort of tells you how counters are, play out basically that you roll for a surprise first, you determine the distance. Um, uh, you might determine the reaction of them. Yeah, the encounter reactions. This is the classic table here of determining uh, NPC reactions. And then if things get hostile, you have to roll for initiative. And then what happens after that, uh, evading attacking, things like that. Key thing here is that the old school thing, that not every encounter necessarily is going to lead to hostility and violence. This is why the reaction role is so important in, in old school plays. You should wait to see what exactly the mood is of these potential opponents, and maybe you may be able to talk your way out of um, a sticky situation, which you probably always want to have on the table considering how deadly combat can be. So once again, at least in my view, I view combat as a fail state. If you have actually rolled initiative, it means things have gone horribly awry. And hopefully you have planned for this eventuality and have stacked the deck in your favor um, by um, getting gaining the upper hand before dice are rolled in the first place. Don't go into combat unless you know you have already won is the key old school tenet here. And, uh, but this goes through the, uh, the different phases. This is classic old school. So you're going to declare whether or not you're going to cast a spell before your own initiative side based initiative, highly recommend it for any game that you're playing, um, where basically one side rolls a D six, the other side rolls a D six, whoever rolls highest wins. And then that allows for what's called tactical infinity, which means that when it's the player's turn, they can decide on their own what the best use of the order of combat is, like who's going to go first, who's going to use uh, spells and missiles and move in certain ways. It's not determined by um, individual initiative. The group can decide as a whole how they would best like to utilize their party to um, overcome the obstacle. And so we have rules for that. And don't forget that a key part of old school combat is morale. Combats do not have to be fought to the death. Have the enemies make morale whenever one of them gets killed or half of their number is down, and maybe they'll run away. That's what makes undead particularly terrifying because undead don't have to roll morale. That's why they are so nasty. And then specific examples of other situations that may arise in combat, very, very useful. These are all optional, so they do add a layer of complexity over combat. I like to usually keep my combat fairly simple and fast if I can at all help it. But I, I like all of these rules. I, I, I myself have not incorporated all of them, but I don't have anything against any of these. And I think they're all really, really fun mechanical additions to combat. But uh, my game is focused more on exploration. And I believe that is probably the intent of the Dolmenwood game as well. It's, it's about exploration. That is the primary pillar. Combat is just another puzzle to be solved, in my opinion. I have incorporated this Death's Door rule over here in the left-hand corner into my Arden Vool game. I really like this. The, the rules as written is basically you're dead at zero hit points. It's really hardcore. I am a fairly hardcore DM, but I'm not that hardcore. But I like this. It um, adds a lot of tension and is really, really nasty. So when you are reduced to zero hit points, you're not dead. You are at Death's Door, so you're unconscious, first of all. And each round, you have a two and six chance of dying. Right, so every time it's your initiative, and I mean that means the party's side of the initiative, you have to roll. Your character has to roll a two and six chance, two and six chance in order to not die, which means you have a thirty-three percent chance of dying every single round. There is no negative numbers or anything like no negative hit points. You just have that you're constantly in that state. However, any healing that takes effect instantaneously like spirit hame, they actually call out the, the herb spirit hame that we talked about earlier, or any sort of um, magic healing or potions um, can save you and it restores you to one hit point immediately. But the penalty for this is that if you are brought back from death's door in any manner, you suffer a permanent loss of one point from a random ability score. That is super nasty, mitigated only by the fact, fact that ability scores are not as emphasized as they are in modern versions of D&D, but man, no one likes to lose a point in ability score. So once again, that makes you really think about whether or not you want to roll that initiative die. So we can see here that Gavin is going to insert an example of combat. I'm going to, I can't wait to actually see this. Uh, I think it's going to be very illuminating for people who are often confused about the phased method of combat in old school versions of these games, which Dolmenwood is, that unless you actually see this in action, 
or see it written out how this works. Um, it can be very, it can be a little bit hard to parse. That's what we, I try to do in our videos as well to sort of make that clear how combat works. So you can, um, if you don't want to wait for Gavin to actually put it into the book, you can just watch some of our videos where we get into fights. And then the appendices. Once again, a part that maybe you don't actually reference that often in other RPG books. There is a lot of good stuff here. Man, this calendar, oh my gosh. I have gotten so much use out of this calendar. Referees, anytime a character, anytime a player comes to your table and rolls up a five minute character, roll for their birthday, man, because it is so much fun. It's depending upon when they're, let's see, yeah, when they were born will determine what their moon sign is and so you can roll here on a random table or use their birthday to determine what that actual moon might be and then each one has a waning waxing and full version of that moon each with specific effects that are tied to it so if your character was born under the waning beast moon they would gain a plus one attack bonus against wolves and bears specifically very very fun very very flavorful a outline of the noble houses Brackenwold is he's the duke that is over all the other houses. They all these are all vassals of the house Brackenwold. Gillifer, Haramore, Hogwash, Malbleet, Mulbrek, Merkin, Nodlock, and Ramius should be noted here that Bregel are actually considered to be citizens of the duchy and hold equal status um, as humans. So that there is actually a few Bregel houses. They are House Malbleet, House Merkin and House Ramius. The other ones are human dominated. Um, and they are uh, the Bregel Lords are known as the Lords of the High Wold, which is the generally the southwestern part of Dolmenwood. The Saints themselves, this is great, a great uh, reference here to add some flavor. Um, I believe this is the, what is the 30? 30, 34 are regarded as primary, and then the 66 are minor. Um, so these give the examples of the spell that is associated with them back in the Holy Spells chapter when their feast day is. So if you have a, um, a cleric or a friar who is their patron saint happens to be one of these guys, you can, you can tell them what their feast day is and what their patronages are basically like their domains or their port portfolios. These are very, very flavorful because sometimes they're like complete non sequiturs. Um, but you can kind of come up with your own reasons why they might have them both. So you hear, see here that St. Horse the Puissant um, has as a patronage mendicants, right? So beggars, but also adders, the snakes, and mushrooms as a, as a uh, minor patronage. So the last part of the player book is an appendix dedicated to the kindred class versions of the kindreds that were described in the earlier part of the book. This is great for folks that are fans of the earlier versions of basic Dungeons and Dragons where there was no separation of race, kindred, and class where races, the kindreds, were actually the class that you played. So you weren't playing an elf fighter, you were playing an elf. The elf was your class. You were just playing a dwarf. You can see this in our videos in the Harles of Arden Vool where uh, Ted, for instance, is playing a goblin. That is his class. It is he is the goblin class. So Gavin has kindly provided versions of that so that instead of playing a Bregel knight, you're just playing a Bregel, right? Um, a elf, a Grimalkin, and a Mossling, and a Woodgrew. Um, and they have different statistics that are separate from their kindred descriptions because there is no marriage of a kindred and then choosing a class. You're actually just playing a Mossling. And I actually prefer this as uh, my own personal taste, but I could certainly see why we'd want the default of just choosing a kindred and a class, which is much that was introduced more in um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition and then in sequent, uh, subsequent editions. And we have thanks. I think I'm in here somewhere. Should be. I better be, Gavin. I better be in here. And uh, credits. That is the player book for the upcoming Dolmenwood tabletop role-playing game currently in Kickstarter, well-funded, mowing through the stretch goals, and hopefully to be released in a little bit more than a year. For Kickstarter backers, I believe that uh, Gavin has promised us the PDFs that you are seeing right here as soon as the kicks or soon after the Kickstarter is over. So soon you'll be able to parse through this all on your own and enjoy it as much as I have for the past few years. So if you've enjoyed this deep dive, please, please, 
Don't forget to like and subscribe. Please don't forget to check out some of our other content on the channel. We have those two campaigns, both for Dolmenwood and for the Halls of Arden Vool, which is our ongoing Mega Dungeon campaign. And recently, we've actually been recording our post-session discussions that we have. Everyone has the post-session discussions, right? After you play a game, you need a little the detox a little bit. We call them the Delve Detoxes, where we discuss aspects of gameplay in the old school style as they related to the events that we just experienced in the, in the session. So if you're looking for some more advice and talk about uh, old school play, which is Dolman Wood is going to be a perfect example of, you should definitely go check that out. And of course, it goes without saying, if you haven't already pledged to the Kickstarter, you absolutely need to do so. It is going to be some of the best money you've ever spent on your own enjoyment and recreation. I can guarantee it. I have played it. I know and you can talk to anybody on the Discord and on social media who has been a Patreon or has experienced this wonderful uh, setting and game, and they will tell you the exact same thing. We are about to witness something that is a watershed mark, I truly believe, in the RPG industry um, as far as the standards of excellence that we all need to ascribe to um, if you are a burgeoning designer or writer in that space. So I hope you've enjoyed your time with me. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time. Have a great night, everybody. Take care.